It is a huge honor for me today to be interviewing an, an amazing woman, Ginger Bratzel, who is so I said to her, I said, your name sounds like a food. And she goes, it actually is. It's German. And it's a pretzel with a brat. And a, what do you say? The St. Louis. Uh, the Cardinals sell it at the stadium. And it's called a Bratzel. A Bratzel. Bratzel. I guess that's what they call it. And you were born in Socorro. Uh, New Mexico. Socorro, New Mexico. Yes, where sir. Where I, uh, where I lost a, uh, in that area where I lost a hundred thousand dollars. How did you do that? Well, I had, I had this RV, and uh, the boys loved it. When I, when we first bought the RV, we left Phoenix, we drove to San Diego, we went all the way up the Pacific, all the way to uh, Seattle, turned right, went all the way to Minnesota and visited my sister in the nunnery, drove all the way down to Texas and back. But when we came back to through New Mexico. Uh, we hooked up with my best friend from middle school, uh, Craig Steichen, and to go, my oldest boy likes elk hunting. Yep. And the other three boys and me, we don't hunt because we don't eat it. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd shoot a cow with a machine gun, uh, <laughs> but I won't shoot an elk or a deer because I won't eat it. And uh, I throw back every fish that I don't want to eat. And anyway, so Craig's in a four-wheel drive uh, truck, and we get to the end of the highway, and he's going to go, and I'm sitting here in my camera. I'm like, I, I can follow him on this. So I'm driving my big old or a town home or whatever the hell it's called, RV. And, you know, all the cabinets are bouncing open, and the boys are bouncing off the bed. It was batshit crazy for, like, you know, five miles. We camped. Everything was fun. Got to elk the whole nine yards. And then on the way home, uh, I kept feeling this weird, weird vibration. So I got back to my dental office. So I got back home. Monday morning, I had one of my staff. I said, yeah, you know, drive it down the RV place, have them detail it, clean it all up and everything, and tell them there's some vibration. About 30, some, some about 30 vibration. minutes later, this guy uh, calls me and says, you need to come down here. I said, I can't come down here. I'm triple booked all day long. You know, what, what's up? He goes, no, you got to come down here. I said, well, I'm not coming down there. You got to tell me over the phone what's wrong. He goes, dude, he goes, this is totaled. Your A-frame underneath the whole thing, which holds the whole thing together, is broken in three different places. I can't believe you drove it home. We're not allowed to weld it together. It's too structurally. Uh, um, he goes. He goes. It's basically right now. It's scrap metal. And I thought, huh, that was a uh, that was a hundred thousand dollar bad decision. But uh, so I won't hold that against you. But then and then, uh, why did you move from there to Oklahoma? Did they run out of elk? So you just decided to uh, move to Oklahoma. Well, I like tornadoes much better. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to sell my practice. And I, th I said, hey, I can start anywhere I want to. I don't have to be here. And my husband's a hygienist. He said, you know what? I really would like to try somewhere else. And Oklahoma just always called to us. And we love the people. And we've loved every moment being here. Wow. Your husband's a hygienist. Does he still practice with you? He does, he does not practice me anymore because I don't practice anymore. So he's still practicing. He comes in and helps coach some of my clients on the side here and there, but he is active in wet gloves every day still. Wow. And did you guys meet in dental school, the dental no. school and the hygiene school? No, nope. he was an electronic tech um, when we got married and we, when I started my first practice and he was in there helping me out for a little bit. He was an office manager and he was supposed to be there for two weeks and five years, six years later, we we're sitting there talking one day and, I, and we were always talking about the turnover in hygiene. And I told him, you know what, the patients love you. I wish you could be my hygienist. And he said, you know what, I've always been thinking about that, and I didn't know how you felt about it. And he said, I'd like to be a hygienist. So he went back to school after I was in practice. That is amazing. You're the only person I've ever heard say that in my entire life. I have not come across another female dentist, male hygienist couple ever. Wow, I do know what's most interesting is that if you have a, uh, a, post, um, ma a master's degree or higher, and you marry someone in your same profession, it's the lowest divorce rate of 9%. Like if a dentist marries a dentist or a lawyer really? marries a dentist. Yeah, it's high education. The two biggest variables on marriage success is um, the later, you know, if you get married at 16, you'll always divorce. You get married at 27, you'll almost never divorce. And if you're highly educated and didn't get married till, you know, in your 20s, that, that seems to be the, uh, the, the core deal. You want your kids to be older and highly educated and marry someone older that's highly educated. And then they'll make educated decisions and not uh, not crazy ones so so you um you're a consultant now um mm -hmm. tell us tell us your story of how you got interested just, just tell our viewers your story because they, they might not have heard of you just tell tell them the big ginger bratzel story sure um as i said i, I practiced in that small town of Socorro. i went back to practice I, I just wanted to be there i thought it was a great place like you said it's got a lot of wildlife and i wanted to be in that kind of area and i bought a really crappy practice and nobody tricked me. I knew it was crappy going in. 
but um, I thought it was because it was the old dentist. It was the old technology. It was all everything he didn't care about, and all they needed was a shiny new penny, me coming in, and I was going to change it around. And I learned very quickly that's not the case. So I went around about it the wrong way trying to grow the practice. I got more continuing ed, and I spent a lot of money on equipment, built a Taj Mahal of office, and all I did is raise my overhead, and everything else was the same. So I stopped thinking about it. I need to solve it from a dental prospect, and I need to solve it from a business prospect, and really started digging into how I was going to change this business. And dental marketing is where I found where I was really lacking. And so I got an education in dental marketing and really dug in, and we turned it around very, very quickly and had a lot of success. And after uh, my accountant saw that, he gave me a call one day, and he said, Ginger, we got a problem with your books. And I was trying to think, what kind of problem can we have? I thought I missed some audit thing or something and he said no you you have too much money I think you made a mistake in entering it into QuickBooks and I said no that's not a mistake that's the truth and he said well what are you doing and I just told him and I told him about my systems and how how it all revolved and he says huh can you teach other dentists how to do that and I said well sure I mean I learned I can teach them and he said I got three dentists lined up you need to help and that's how I started a coaching business on the side and so I had a full-time practice and a full-time coaching and consulting business for dentists on helping them grow their practices. And when did that start? What, what, what year did you get out of dental school? What year did you start consulting? Um, 94 is when I graduated from dental school. So I went about and struggled for a while. And then in 2001, I started consulting on the side. In 2003, I had a full-time business. So now you're a full-time dental consultant. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you like that? I, I love that because, you know, what... I couldn't do in my practice is I can only see so many people a day. Now I can leverage that across many practices. So in working through these dentists, I can have help more patients that way. I love the transformation. I love empowering the team. And I love the doctors when the stress melts off of them. They said, you know, I didn't know it had to be so difficult. I can do it easier. So I love getting those results for them and gives me a real high. And your your book, your new book is splashed out all over uh, social media. You can't uh, you can't log on to Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus without seeing it. Tell when when did your book come out? Uh, it came out late last year. Um, got a lot of traction this year. You know, it was something I did for my clients. I wasn't um, really w thinking it was going to be this book big book launch, and and it got a lot of traction. And I didn't realize how much traction until a couple months ago. I was sitting around in my office working, and I get a call from Linda Miles or a Facebook message, and said, "Can you please call me? I'm on vacation. I want to talk to you about my book." And when Linda Miles calls, you know, and she gives you her phone number, you pick up and you call Linda Miles. She is an amazing woman. I always called her my mother in dentistry, and uh, um, most of the things she told me was in, in the scolding, pointing your finger, Adele. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, she's, she's my godmother. She said, I'm going to give you some godmother advice, Ginger. I'm going to tell you what was, you're going to do. She's never been a fan of any of my jokes during my seminars. Well, she's, 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 she, she's always like, aren't you afraid you're going to offend someone? I said, she's a southern afraid, lady. afraid, that's my job. My job is to make the hair on the back of your, no, I, I've always believed just be true to yourself. And mm -hmm. I, I, I can't be some G rated Disney. I, I can't be those people. I'm just not. And, and where I learned my uh, comedy humor was from my dad and his two brothers. They're the funniest guys I'd ever met in my life to this day. And they, uh, even though they went to mass every morning, seven days a week, their entire life, and said the rosary every night before they went to bed, they cussed like sailors and told the wildest jokes you've ever heard of in your life. I mean, he would tell jokes driving out of the church parking lot that if the priest or nun would have heard it, they would have uh, uh, let the air out of his tires. So tell us, <laughs> tell, so tell us your book, Secrets of Creating a Prosperous Dental Practice, the mindset, business, and people you get to drink. Uh, to your dream practice and is known for her whole notes bar. T talk, talk about your book. What, what is the essence? What is the message of your book? Well, everyone comes to me um, for dental marketing. They say, I need more new patients. That's always the essence of it. But usually it's the underlying things are really holding them back. So, you know, very quickly, I call it the three M's. So marketing's one of them, but the ne next M is management. So when we start peeling back the curtains and looking what's really going on, there are systems not in place. The team don't know what to do. The doctor's not stepping up and leading where they need to be. So that holds them back. And then the mindset. I mean, I, dental school brainwashes a lot of people. 
and it tells them that you're dumb and you're a loser and they, it really just sucks any little bit of self-esteem out of a lot of these people. So it's rebuilding them and rebuilding their teams and letting them know that they can really achieve this if they work together. And as you said, no holds bar. I, I don't I don't try to censor myself. I'm just who I am. So, you know, some people came back and said, your book's real spiritual. And I, you know, I didn't write it as a spiritual book. I just, that's what Ginger Sharon, um, that's, you know, my story. I think there's certain things that there's certain forces outside that change things. And also, I think there's a big part of you within yourself. You've got to change things. Yeah. Uh, the religious mindset is bizarre because you have everybody from the far left to like Bill Maher who says, you know, there's absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all crazy. There was nothing. It condensed into a singularity, exploded, and everything bounced around. So you have butterflies and ice cream. Okay. And then you got the whole other end that says, oh, I know the guy's name, and you can't eat shellfish. <laughs> and I think, the, uh, I think the whole planet is moving towards the humility and the humbleness of spiritual. The bottom line is you just don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, God, there's a big universe out there. For you to stand here on this earth with 10 toes and say, oh, I know there's nothing all the way to, I can tell you the name of the guy who put the rings around Saturn and you can't eat shellfish. I mean, I mean, people just need to take a chills pill and so, you know, you, you don't know. You just don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hum, humbling experience. I got up this morning and, uh, you know, this morning and you see the, uh, the, um, the moon out there and you see there's three planets out there right next to each They're other. They're almost in line, aren't they? They're almost in line. What, what are they? Is, I assume it's uh, I have Mercury, Venus, and uh, Mars or uh, no, not wouldn't be Mercury. It'd be Venus, Mars, and Jupiter or whatever. But you, you sit there and you look at that. And this morning, a satellite flew right through him. And a guy on Facebook, uh, Kim um, Baywas, uh, he saw it too. And I mean, it, it's a it's a humbling experience. So it's okay that your book comes off spiritual because that just means you're a humble person. I'm, I'm just transparent, and I'm not going to try filter it back, as you said. Yeah, you're just you're just humble, and it's all right. To, you know, I used to love that about my favorite teachers when they could answer when someone could ask them a question. They'd say, "You know, that's a great question. I have no idea." Good. Whereas Appreciate all the that. other, whereas all the other PhDs would be, you know, yeah. they'd just start, you know, bullshitting something. Uh, so, so go through those marketing management mindset. Go, go, you go through those. Or, or okay, so marketing to to me, everyone thinks it's new patients. To me, it's a scale. So you got to have just as many new patients as existing patients. You've got to keep them, that leaky bucket syndrome. So if everyone's focused on getting more new patients, they're ignoring their existing patients. And I tell them, you can't do that. So we really want to balance that out. You have to have a certain number of new patients for growth. You have people leaving, you know, people moving, people die. But if you don't hold on tightly, and this is where I think practices are, are making it or breaking it on how well they can keep their patients and find reasons for them to come back and serve them well, is going to determine your success. So that's my first M of that. Um, management. So again, leadership from the doctor. You cannot delegate leadership. You can't have someone come in. In dental school, they spend no time on leadership development. Um, and I find dentists, a lot of dentists by nature, are not leaders. They're introverts. They like the, the technical stuff. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're forced to run a business. And they're like, who the heck did this? I don't know what's going on. So they think they can hire someone to come and do that. So we try to build the leaders up, and each leader is different. And um, we want them to be the leader in their own way and because that empowers them and empowers their team. Because the team follows their doctor. They believe in their doctor. They want to do anything they can for their doctor. And they just want their doctor to rise up to that occasion. And once we get both of them on the same path, that really happens. And then um, mindset. Well, before we, before we go to mindset, I, I want to go back to leadership because – you know, the mm -hmm. way I see it, when you, when uh, I, I'm, I'm a big NFL fan, I know it's a waste of time and it's, it's, it's sillier. It's just as equally stupid as the Jerry Springer show. It makes, <laughs> it makes no difference who wins or lose. And I'm sitting there and, you know, I just so want the Cardinals to win. It's so, it's just silly. But you see the coaches walking up and down the field and throwing towels and, you know, totally into the game. And they're just, I mean, they're just, they're just obsessed in the game. And then you see, you go into the dental office, as soon as the dentist is done doing his hygiene check, just walks in his private office, shuts the door. And then they and, beep him. They uh -huh. beep him. And then he comes out and he checks, uh, does something else, does a filling crown, working on it, goes back. I mean, I, I, I just, how can you, how can you turn a man or woman like that into being a leader? I mean, were you born that way or can you become a leader? I think all of us have leadership qualities. 
And if you push them too far, if you say you got to be a leader like an NFL coach, they're going to shut down. But if you can find some way for them to lead and still be authentic and true to themselves, and that can happen. And a lot of that is they just don't watch what they need to do. They don't have that conversation. They don't um, praise the team like they should. They said, you know, I have a great team, but when's the last time you talked to them? Like, for instance, I was talking to a doctor this morning, and he's like, I'm having problems with that same employee. And I said, now let's, let's talk about this. Does this, first as a leader, does this employee need to go? You, you need to make that decision for your business. Is she, is she the wrong person in the wrong position? Can you move her somewhere else in the office? And we keep pulling it back. He has never really trained her, and he's really not talked to her. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't even know she's displeasing him. And I said, if you're failing her. Now, if you went through all those things, and you trained her, and you, you corrected her, and you went through that, and she's still doing it, then we need to get rid of her. But you have not given her anything to succeed in her business. And he said, I've never thought of it that way. You know, I, I have always said, if, if you fire a, an employee and they're shocked, you're a bad person. You're not just a bad manager, a bad business owner. You're, you're a bad person. I mean, yeah. they got bills to pay. They're leveraged. They got house payments, car payments. They didn't see this coming. So you better, if they didn't see it coming, you better give them at least a month's severance pay because, because I think the human nature is, a social animal has to work together and we all obey the 400 pound gorilla. And so nobody wants to have an uncomfortable conversation. That's the way you're born. And right. you gotta, they they and, avoid and you walk. conflict. They avoid conflict, avoid conflict. All social animals, cats, dogs, monkeys, apes, humans, they all do it. So you have to override your walnut brain in the deep down middle with your frontal cortex. And, and you got to, how do you coach a dentist to sit down and have an uncomfortable conversation with a staff member? We first, we work on the dentist. We don't go after the team member. We're going to make that a better dentist first. And that goes back to the mindset. And I, dentists get confused. I really hate the word mindset because it's thrown around a little too generously. And dentists are so cerebral anymore because they think they're so smart. They think they have mindset. But analytical thinking is not mindset. So I call it gut set. And I get them to stop thinking here with their head and start more in the middle. Good, because I got like 50 extra pounds in the middle. I should be good at this. Keep You're going. really smart. You got a big part there. I must be a genius. You're a genius. So tell so me we, how my big belly is going to change my world. Well, let's, let's go a little more inside. Let's talk about your <laughs> gut and your heart and, and what you really need to do. Most of these guys are just, or gals are just following along. There's like the guy next door is doing it, so that's the way I'm doing it. They don't, they don't do what they want to do. They're not running the business they, the way they intend it, and they're just following blindly. And I said, why are you doing that? Well, because the guy next door is doing it, or that's how they told me to do it back in dental school. And I said, does that make sense to you? Is it right for you? Is that what you want to be doing? Is that the kind of practice you want? Well, I, I don't know. I said, well, if you don't know, who's going to know? There's no clarity there. So you got to really work on yourself and get crystal clear and real honest and transparent with yourself. And so, you know, I take these little introverts and I see them blue blossom into not extroverts, but they're like, hey, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a different guy or gal. I can do this. So um, I hate to say this. I'm, I'm extra sensitive to women because I grew up with five sisters. In fact, <laughs> a lot of my uh, friends are extremely mad at me because I told them I'm going to vote for Hillary regardless because just because she's a woman. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. I don't want her seeing a world where all the presidents are men, but I hear all kinds, you know, I get about 300 messages, emails a day or whatever, but I always get this common question by young girls to say, you don't get it. You're a man. You, you know, it's so easy for you to be a leader in the office, but I'm a young woman and the women assistants and receptionists and hygienists, they don't respond to women like they do mm -hmm. men. And then is that, and I'm a man, so I, I, I don't know. Is, is that, is that just an excuse or is that a reality? Do you think do you think women employees react differently to women leaders? I 100%, 130,000%, yes. They, they think you're like one of their team. They don't think of you as a supervisor necessarily. And when- They I'm think gonna, you're I'm, their friend. Their friend. And then when you have to come down on her, and I must say a word here, when you have to come down on, you're not a supervisor, you're the bitch. And they would never treat a man that way. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to need you to, to slow down and go into big detail that because it's the most common question I get from women 20 to 30, and I have no means of answering them. So I, I can't answer. So you got to spend a little more time on this. So spend, take, take some time on this because you're, you're, you're talking to thousands of people, and I assume half of them are women. So slow down, Spanky, and go along on this answer. 
Well, I think sometimes as a, as a female owner, and I did this for a long time, we just intermingle a little too much. You know, when you're a male dentist, they put you out, you know, we're going to lunch. They don't necessarily ask you to do this. We're going to go shopping. You're talking fashion. They think because they talk those things and you intermingle those conversations, all of a sudden you're on common ground. And I see female employees saying things to female doctors that they have no business saying. They should never, ever say. And it's crossed that line. So it's really hard for a female dentist because we want to be liked as a human being, not necessarily because we're weak, but just like it's a male, you want to be liked. And so people do things to be liked. And when female employees sometimes latch on this, and this is just my theory, and I'm sure someone's going to disagree with it, um, but female employees latch on to that, they, they, they make a different connection. They would never interpretate, interpret what you say in the same way as a male as they would to a female dentist. And so they're like, now, you know, you're one of the sisterhood and we all stick together. And also, I'm going to say another thing. There's a lot of hormones running around in a dental office and you have that much females in a short, in a, a period together. It's, it's chaos. So having a male hygienist, having my husband there as a male, it, it, it helped even things out. See, you know? I, ne I never want to say, uh, you know, they say, you know, uh, I, I went through comedy school. I mean, I professionally do comedy. Um, they say you never talk about sex, religion, politics, violence. Right. And, so some, and you're pushing me in areas I never talk about so, like this. But that, that's why I call it dentistry uncensored. I want to talk about the things that aren't talked about. But you know what? I, I hate to say this because it sounds so sexist, but it seems to me the women dentists I know that are doing the best have a male assistant, have a male up at the front desk. They, they bring more men into the office uh, as employees. And, and a lot of them tell me, and I'm sure they don't want to be quoted or named, but they just say, you know, I wish all my employees were men. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm hearing both ends. I'm hearing the older, successful women crushing it, saying I have no problems with my three male employees and my two women are 99% of my problems. And then you hear the young girls telling me all the time, and they told our friend Linda Miles that she once had a lecture given on it, how women uh, manage or whatever. And you have the young girls saying they don't listen to me, but they'll listen to the old 70-year-old man back there. Uh, so, so, so what do you recommend uh, specific? I, I go over this. What are rules of engagement? If you're a 30 year old woman and you got five women working for you, you got two assistants, two receptionists, a hygienist. Do you go to happy hour with them? Do you, do you, I mean, what, what can that, you do and not do to cross the line? Where is that line? You, I think you have to have team time that you interact with. And so you do go to happy hour there, but your personal time if you cross that line, you need to be prepared that there's no coming back. And I've made that mistake in my own practice. I mean, I really liked my team, but it gets to a point where sometimes when you have to let someone go, they're like, well, how could you do that? She was one of us. I'm the boss. I'm the employer. So I think you should have social interaction that's appropriate with the team, but you, you need to have, be big enough as a human being to, to have your own social life outside the practice too. You know, the, one of the greatest geniuses that ever lived as far as the human mind was Abraham Maslow. Um, mm -hmm. I liked uh, him and Dozen Morris are my two classics. <clears throat> and Maslow on management, he wrote a management book. It was one of the last books he ever wrote. <clears throat> he wrote the hierarchical um, needs of, you know, um, um, food, water, sex, shelter, self-esteem, self-actualization, whatever. But on Abraham Maslow, he said that a employer can never, ever truly be a friend of an employee mm -hmm. because you always hold over them the power to fire them, mm -hmm. which oftentimes turns their life upside down. So when you hold a paycheck over somebody, he, in fact, this is crude and rude. And I'm sorry I have to say it, but I'm using his words. He, he equated to the difference between you make love for free, but a prostitute, you pay money. And when you're paying money to someone, it's not love and it's not your friendship because you hold that over them. And he says, I'm sorry. You can't be friends with someone you hold money over. It's a form of power, force, coercion. Those are his words. So he said you, mm -hmm. you're, you're never a true friend with somebody that you can fire and quit giving money. And, you know, when you go back to that, if you shock somebody, this is where those shock situations come across. I thought we were friends. We go out together because you just can't separate that. And, you know, if someone can, kudos to them, but I know very few. Even when, like, why work best with my clients? I work best with male clients. I can tell them what to do. They'll listen. The, the female clients, I think a male person might be better because they get real emotion and they think they can tell me things that they shouldn't tell me. 
you know, they get, they break down and they just fall apart. And I was like, you know what? You got to hold yourself together. You're the boss here. You can't go to puddles because you get around a female and you do that. You can't, you shouldn't tell me those things. And you should have sacred people, your friends you tell to, but I'm not your, your, your psychologist. I'm not your girlfriend that you can lay down your hair and go through it with that. So like my men clients, I can go through and be very honest with them and very blunt. And, you know, I never played the chick card. Um, you know, when people would point out, said you did very good for uh, successful for a female dentist. I said, I'm never comparing myself to a female dentist. I'm a dentist. I'm a business person. And my dad raised me to be, I guess, a tomboy, a hunter, fisher, you know, I rode motorcycles. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to do those things. So that's how I'm geared. And so sometimes that's hard for females to take. And so that's why I relate well to the male clients. I, I keep reminding myself and my four sons that we, we only got one grandchild and it's a little Taylor and she's three. I keep saying, you know, is, this girl probably doesn't even know she's a girl right now. We got, no, we, I don't think we, she does. We, should, we got to do something girly. Someone throw a pink truck at her or, a, or get her a Barbie doll because she thinks a shotgun and camping is, a, uh, is an activity. Would you say, um, um, here, um, first of all, how does someone get a hold of your book? If they wanted to read your book, uh, how, how, would, how would they get, find it? I can make it easy. You just go to Amazon and put it in there. And what would you type in? Uh, the Secrets of Creating a Prosperous Practice or Ginger Bratzel. Ginger Bratzel. I don't know how you cannot remember Bratzel. It's a bratwurst with a pretzel. B-R-A-T-Z-E-L. <laughs> so does that mean deep down inside you're really a brat? The, uh, yes, I am. And is that a spoiled brat or a brat as the oh, good thing no, that no, you no, eat no, on a I'm, sandwich? I'm not a spoiled brat, no. And, and how much is that book on Amazon? Uh, it's less than 20 bucks. I think it's like 18 okay. something. Here, here's my, here's, um, so, so much of success is counterintuitive. There are a lot of things, right. your, your body is telling you to do this based on millions of years of evolution and success is, that's why success is so counterintuitive. I think that the um, um, dentist want help. They're just afraid that they're going to hire a consultant to come in and do something that they are not being true to themselves. Like, like come in and say, well, you need to be a cosmetic dentist and do uh -huh. Botox or you need to be this leader. And they think of leaders from TV as tall, dark and handsome men with fancy cars and all this stuff. So I, so I think the best way to decide if you're a personal fit um, dentist, cause you're talking to 7,000 dentists right now, get her book. Um, and then I also think that on the online CE, we put up 350 one hour courses and they've been viewed over half a million times. And every consultant that put their course up, it exploded because the other consultants think, well, if I go in there and tell them what I'm going to do, they don't need me. I'm not going to give away all my secrets for free. And I think, well, then you're thinking in fear and scarcity. Right. But if you think in hope, growth, and abundance, here's what actually happens. There, when I go to a restaurant, I want to see a menu and I want to order a salmon and not chicken or a pork chop and not a steak. And they want to see how you think because mm -hmm. what, how dentists buy consults is not um, you're going to come in with some magic bullet I never thought of. It's you're going to get her done. You're going to get her implemented. I'm paying for implementation. Just like when I go to a restaurant, I can go home and cook a pork chop and I'm going <laughs> to give you money because I want you to cook it. I'm being lazy. And a lot of dentists just, they just tell me, um, they just tell me, you know, I, I'm just not going to get done. So I want you to address two questions. I, I want you to go over, uh, I believe some consultants work better um, with certain types than others. I, I do believe. Yeah, so some people, this one might be your cup of tea. This one, it might be your cup of vodka. Right. And this one, it might be a cup of cyanide. Um, so I want you to describe um, some case study or talk about, you know, who would be, you're talking to all these people, who could call you and say, wow, I, I'd give anything. I'd, I'd hire you to come in my office and get that done. What, what is your t best client scenario? Okay. Well, I, you know, when I look at clients, I see dentists in different levels. So people think, uh, I, I consider myself a coach. I don't consider my consultant because consultant tells you what to do. A coach is going to help you and get you prepared. So that's the way I look at it uh, is from my framework. And there's dentists at different levels. So there's practices that are very um, cosmetic driven, as you talked about. They have certain images. They're very concerned what they're going to look like. And, you know, there's a whole chunk right in the middle, and I call them the bread and butter kind of guys. And they have just been chugging along. And they, you know, they show up to work, they do their thing, they don't complain a lot. Um, in fact, if they're having any problems, they haven't even told their team about it. And they're just kind of, a lot of them are just sitting here waiting it out. That's the phrase. The economy's got to get better, so I'm sitting here waiting it out. And they get to a point, they said, you know what? 
I've realized it's not going to get better without me doing something and I need to take responsibility. So these guys are just kind of average Joes and that's what I call them, bread and butter. And they said we do a little of this and do a little of that and I, I just I just want to be in a better situation. I'm not ready to retire. A lot of these, my guys are you know 50 um, and above. I said I'm not ready to retire but I kind of think of this as my last leg, my last big run and I want to make it a really good run. So, um, you know, I need some help with doing that. And so if they can handle brutal honesty, and they laugh at me when we have a coaching meeting at some of the stuff that comes out of my mouth because I'll just tell them that, you know, get over it. Um, I have a uh, sign. I have a W and I have an M in my, um, my meetings. And I ask them, are you going to be a martyr? Are you sitting here holding on to that sorry story and you're going to believe that? Or are you going to turn it around to be a winner and we're going to do something about it? And that's their choice. So, you know, if they want to do the work and they're not worried about getting dirty, I can help them do that. And, and if they can handle bluntness, we can get along. If they want me to tell them, you know, you, you need to do this and you need to do this and I'm not going to get upset because sometimes I do and I give them the truth, then that's not going to be a match. And, you know, that's why I just resonate with these. A lot of them are in the Midwest. It just, you know, they have those uh, Midwest values and that's my kind of guys. Yeah, I was born and raised in Kansas. My whole pedigree is from Kansas to Parsons. And um, one of my mom's brother lived where you did in Oklahoma, Uncle Mark, who had seven, uh, seven kids, six daughters and a son. Um, I want you to talk about this. A lot of these kids listening to you are sitting there saying, um, you know, if they, if they go to a private school like Nova or AT mm -hmm. Steel or something, they're coming out 400000 in debt. Yep. They go to a public school, they're coming out $250,000 in debt. Um, everything you read is so advertising driven. So they believe they're never going to be successful without a $150,000 Cirax machine from Serona mm -hmm. Dead Supply, a $100,000 CBCT from CareStream, a $75,000 BioLace. Do you see these high tech, because you started off the program that you thought that when you built your Taj right. Mahal, you just increased your debt. What do you think about these high priced toys? And do you see dentists being successful and happy with their earnings without these toys? Or do you think they're, they're a return on investment? Uh, I, I think it's real, for a lot of people, it's a hard time for them to get a return on investment. Dentists are toy seekers. They like shiny things. And that's, that's one of the things we always go around about. They want another gizmo gadget because that's what's going to do it. Until you put the emphasis on the patients and what they need and what they need to hear, you're not going to have that success. Now, some of these guys, just by nature, by their attitude, by how charismatic they are, they, they accidentally happen it. But another toy is not going to make it happen for you. And if, even if you have a Serac machine and you say, I can do a crown in a day, and I'm going to say another phrase, WTF, because th what does that mean to the patient? A crown in a day. But if you can emphasize to them that's one less visit you're going to have to make, um, that's less time off from work, that's less inconvenience, that's more comfort for you. Those are the words they need to hear. So it's not the toy. So they'll, they'll say, I got a Serac machine. And I say, so who cares? I've got, uh, you know, a Galileo. I don't care. Patients don't know that. Until you figure out what they want to hear and say what they need to say, that's going to really hang you up. And it's funny, they'll say, yeah, but you know, you don't have to have a temper, you don't have to come back. And I'll, and I'll say, okay, well, Here's the names of 1,000 dentists who collected over a million dollars last year and took home $400,000 that don't have anything. In fact, mm -hmm. half, half of them still do amalgams. Right. Half of them, they're doing amalgams and they make 400,000 and you're telling me how great your CBCT is and last year you made 127. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, right. I, I, I don't get it. I, I wanna ask you another question. Um, <clears throat> Do you think, because you're, because again, the, these podcasts are so weighted towards the young. I mean, old people like me, none, none of my friends have. They ever, don't even know what a podcast I is. I know. I still don't have one drinking buddy who's listened to one of my podcasts, you know. They're all kids. Um, but they're, when they're coming out of school, do you, do you think it's a huge uh, advantage to go rural instead of urban? I think that's a tremendous opportunity. I think because you have a captive audience, you have people who appreciate you being there. And you can do it conservatively. I think when you come out of school, you need to really like the taste of ramen noodles. I think you really need to like that junky old car. And I think you need to work your tail off and pay your dues. A hundred percent of all the dentists I met who walked out of dental school did one million their first year and took home 400,000. 
a hundred percent were rural. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who did that in Scottsdale, Beverly Hills, San Diego, Manhattan, you know, Miami. I, 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 just, I just don't get it. I, okay. and, 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 and then their other choice, they, they won't go rural, but their other choice was to join the Navy so they'd be in an aircraft carrier floating around the Pacific <laughs> Ocean for six months with 5,000 boys. Uh, they, they don't even touch land for half a year at a time. And they almost did that for the Navy on a salary, but they won't go to a town of 5,000 that's an hour away from a major metro. Yeah, you, you've got to get real humble, I think. And I, I think that was one of the things about our success was being able to do that. We would go where people wouldn't go. And um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. And people always say, well, they'll travel to see us. Yeah, but they'll be really happy to, to come to you there. Yeah, and that was Walmart. And, and Rick um, Workman of Heartland, he stole that chapter right out of Sam Walton. Uh, Walmart was in 32 states before they went to a major city. Right. And, and Heartland was, uh, uh, Rick Workman was a genius calling insurance companies and saying, you know, you sell insurance to all the firemen, teachers uh, for the entire state of Illinois. Do you ever get complaints from patients who have this insurance that says there's no dentist in my area? And they go, yeah. And they gave him a list of these cities that didn't have a dentist in there. And they're all under 5,000. And Rick just starts stamping out dental offices out there. Next thing you know, he's got 1,000 offices and a jet just going with a supply of dentistry where, where, nobody, uh, where nobody was. Uh, amazing. And I, I also want to make one comment about the retirement dentist. A lot of dentists on Dentaltown, you know, they're always talking about the big thing now on Dentaltown. They're talking about Tony Robbins' new America best 401k and they're all trying to sock away 401k money because they all want to retire and and what's funny to me is that you know Ray Kroc died and 40,000 McDonald's still go fine Sam Walton the Walmart died and they opened 40 new Walmarts a month um, if you're business if you were really a businessman you wouldn't even have to retire or sell your practice you could just quit working it and two associates would be in there mm -hmm. at running a $2 million machine, spinning off 300,000 of you, whatever you could sell your practice for, you would make um, in net income in two, two and a half years. And, and if you got your business together with help from people like you, like you're not doing dentistry anymore. I mean, I don't have to do dentistry anymore. I, I'm at the age where I don't have to do anything unless I want to. It's just for fun. Right. Um, why, why? So the fact that you want to re sell your practice and retire, to me, is just a big red flag. That you never were a business person. No. Because, dude, the most successful business people die and their business doubles the first five years after they're dead. I mean, if you were a businessman, why would you want to sell your practice? So when some old dentist says, you know, I want to retire and I want to sell my practice and retire, it's like, dude, why don't you just be a businessman? Why don't you just be a business? Why don't you just learn the business of dentistry and uh, then you wouldn't even have to do the dentistry? And I would rather have a dental office business in a low competitive industry. You think dentistry right. is competitive? Imagine a steakhouse or a, or a dry cleaner or, uh, you know, all these retail businesses that have go in and out of business. I've been in all to you for 28 years. And every time I go to Safeway, the one shop next to it's out of business, the new one's in. I mean, mm -hmm. they just rotate. But dentistry will be there 100 years from now. Why wouldn't you want to own a dental office instead of a dry cleaner or a restaurant? Well, that's what I talk to them about. And I talk about in the book. What's the difference between a business and a company? And a company doesn't need you there. A business, you are showing up. You have a glorified job. So and that's what most dentists are. I don't make money unless I'm there. I cannot take off time to go invest and improve my practice because it'll be shut down because they have no systems to make sure they're making money without them. And, and when, when they, they, they complain so much about buying about the job, but you just said they're buying a job, you know, to come out with your student loan debt in a country of America where 330 million people live in 100 million homes and average combined household income is 50,000 a year. And that's everybody yeah. in the house working, throwing their money into paychecks, 50 grand. And the average dentist, the average makes three combined household incomes at $150,000. So if you're whining about a $250,000 in debt to buy a job where you make three average household incomes and go to all those houses in America and walk in any house in Phoenix and say, hey, how would you like to make $150,000 a year? I mean, they're, they're, rich. Just, they're just like, oh my God, they, they, they would think, I mean, that's just amazing. So, so what, so, um, who's your perfect client? You're talking to a bunch of people who should call you. And, and by uh, the way, how do they contact you? They just go to gingerbratzel.com or yep, do, they can do you go prefer there. email or phone number? They can start there. It's got email there. You can call, you can email results at gingerbratzel.com 
or you can call the office at 405-225-0254. But that's all on the website. We keep it all real easy. And you're into, you're into twos and fives. That meant 405-225-0254. <laughs> 0254, yep. You must have had something good happen to you when you were age two or five or 25. Which one was that's it? That's my lucky number. Two is my lucky number. Is that your lucky number? So, yeah. so um, they can email you results at Um Tell us, tell us a, a case history or t- tell, tell a story about someone that gave you money and what you did for them and now they're glad you gave them money. Because what, what I am trying to tell my viewers is that, you know, the neatest thing about doing this for three decades, I can assure you that all the practices I know that, do a million to four million a year and take home 400 to 600 to seven they all over the 20 30 years had a dozen different consultants come in their office right and then all the people who never got to 500,000 a year they're still paying interest on their student loans and their house and their practice 20 years later they're always saving money not buying a consultant Mm -hmm. and it's it's like you know you're a dentist. You wouldn't want somebody to try to do a root canal on themselves. You got no formal training and these consultants in dentistry cannot stay in business if they don't have happy customers uh, with the world of internet and Yelp and dental town with 205,000 people. You can't, you can't be horrible and a waste of everybody's time and money and not go out of business and consult any, any consultant that's been in staying business, this industry, five, 10 years has got a lot of happy campers. And so, 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 I think the biggest problem you have is everybody that desperately needs you will never hire you. And everybody that does hire you is just like, well, I'm already kicking ass, but I'm going to invest because I just want to kick a little more ass. That's exactly it. They're uh, like, I'm doing good, but I know I can do better. That's exactly it. I know. And and I mean, people, people have said to me before and they, they'll say, well, why did you have a consultant? It's like, because I want a successful office. I I, I don't know everything. I mean, I, 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 you want to steal from the best. So, and by the way, how much is your consulting service? Um, they can come in at different levels. I mean, they, we could do a two-day workshop with me. We can start at three grand, and we can get a big jump on some practices. And then we have some private clients up that get a lot of TLC at fifty thousand dollars. So there's there's a couple spans in there, um, in range. So it, it just depends what's appropriate if they're a match for what we do, and um, and making it all happen. So, you know, what is my ideal client? Um, is a solo owner. Usually they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, they might be by themselves or they have associate dentist. And I like solo owners because I need one person to make a decision. When I have partners, we can't make decisions. And, you know, no disrespect to partnerships, but I just don't find we make a lot of progress there. So I need someone who's going to be accountable and who's going to be responsible. And so it's usually a bread and butter type practice. They can have associates, but they're usually employees and they want to kick some more butt. So, you know, like one of my guys is out of uh, Iowa, uh, you know, just kind of a regular kind of Joe. And when I met him, he was doing about 600,000. And he said, if you told me, Ginger, I need a million dollars to do a million dollars, that I would just said it would kill me because I feel like I'm busting my hump now. And now, you know, we're down the road four or five years later and he's doing three million a year. And he said, you know what? It's easier now than doing that $600,000 way back when. And my new book um, talks about you manage people, time, and money. Um, I I, I still think if you, people are 80% of them, you get an A in the people and they got, you know, the right mindset and management and leadership and the the, the time and money just almost take care of themselves. What HR advice could you give to people? Um, When I talk to Dennis and I, I, you know, my first question is, um, is, you know, same with my employees. Like if I go to employees, they all smile, I'll say, hey, Cammie, what's keeping you up at night? Um, what, what, what's the only thing that in your job that makes your stomach hurt? I, I want to get right to the point. I, I don't want to hear fluff and I want to hear this, and that. When I meet Dennis, I say, you know, what, what, what's your biggest problem? Young Dennis, very young, 25 to 30, will sit there and say, you know, I hate endo or I can't find the canals. Right. All. But, but anybody after 10 years experience just say, oh my God, it's sometimes team. I want to strangle team. my stat, my hygienist. Oh my God. I swear to God, sometimes all I can do by my dental assistant is bite my tongue, you know, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So talk, talk people. Well, I, I believe certain people are meant for this and some are not. I'm looking for when, when they go to hire somebody, I'm looking people who are fact finders. That's why I said, so we'll, we'll go through and do a Colby. We'll look at fact finder. I want someone who is a fast start because if I tell them to go do it, I want it done yesterday. 
when they the biggest problem I see dentists they, they say I want someone who's got that entrepreneurial spirit spirit I'm like why you're supposed to be the entrepreneur and if they're so good and they have that spirit they're gonna go off and do it for themselves they're kinda of floaty kinda of people so I want people who do their job and do it quick and so we'll go through and we'll do a, a, an assessment on there I'll look at things are they I'll gauge them are they executors are they if they're strategic thinkers I don't need another thinker I need doers and so I'll go through and we'll do a profile um, when, with my clients and that's something we do exclusively for them I have the gingers assessment and we'll look at it so when we have a problem with somebody I said you know what let's go through and do this assessment and we find out really quickly the other thing is you is don't this you do, is this something you do online or you give them a, a form I do it a form and it's when they come in this intake when they become clients so we'll go through and they said I need to hire this person and I'm pretty sure I want to hire them people fall in love with people who are like us because it makes us feel comfortable that's now, why all my staff all my staff are short fat bald women oh wow that and they have a real big tummy huh yep I and can see that bald. about you so I mean that just makes us feel comfortable and we think and then they go the opposite direction said I need to go totally different I, you know I've been higher wrong I'll go I'll go and then it's just nothing but friction you there's personality and then there's talents and there's skill and then there's natural programming of how they do things so I think there is a science to HR and I think even if they get the right person you still have to train them and you still have to retrain them I don't I can't tell you how many doctors I'll talk to I say have, have you had a when's the last time you had a meeting uh, what are those you know yeah we talked about them we had one a few years ago I said if you're not meeting and retraining and, and consistently calibrating and syncing the whole team why the heck are you even getting out of bed in the morning how often should a staff have a staff meeting I think they should have a smaller meeting once a week you should have a huddle every morning so everyone's on the same sync first of all it gets everyone there at the same time and gets their job done and including the doctor that's the biggest complaint I hear from team members the doctor shows up late that's number one so we'd love to do it but he's here late so getting there uh, uh, they should have a morning huddle five ten minutes real quick they should have uh, about an hour weekly meeting and I think they should have an, a 90 minute to two hour monthly meeting that is really on training it is never a bitch section session we're talking numbers we're talking accountability and we're always improving the team what do you think of these offices uh, that um, they all connect up on a walkie-talkie a Motorola walkie-talkie so they I personally that f drove me nuts I, I can understand that sounds good on paper but I don't want someone's voice in my head when I'm working and I think that's kind of micromanaging and kind of chaotic chaotic I know some teams that do really well with it I absolutely threw them in the trash after a week is that because you already had three voices in your head at the same time and I the fourth so. one was just the you know <laughs> the, the fourth one was just the, the breaking point um so you know there's there's key there's there's things you just associate with success in office that you can just checklist and say oh you do this you're successful I think the morning huddle is one of them it seems like everybody I know who's happy healthy functional they all start the morning huddle and when they start telling me their nightmare drama or whatever the first thing you can find out they, they don't have a morning huddle do you, do uh -huh. you see that too or do you agree with that or just I 100% like I said usually the doctor comes in late nobody is accountable to anybody they're just kind of just wander in there they kind of get there they kind of wander out in the day yeah um, what else? Um, so I want I want to throw you under a bus with this one. I'm going to get you in trouble. I you haven't thrown me under a bus already. I feel like I've been under the bus the whole time. This is dentistry uncensored because I, I am I'm throwing you under a bus right now because a lot of these people commuting to work, uh, the dentist is driving to work, and the spouse, whether it's a woman dentist married to a male or a male dentist married to a female or whatever or two males whatever, but um, um, doctor's spouse being work in the office. Good idea, bad idea. What, what's red flags that it's good? What's red flags that it's bad? Well, when it causes conflict in the team, that, and usually the team will say the spouse is the problem. That, that's one of the first things they'll, they'll give to you. You know, I had a spouse that worked in the office, but he knew, I, I'm going to say this, and he's going to say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you said it. But he knew who the boss was. It wasn't, you know, he was sort of co-owner of the practice, but there was a decision to be made, and there was some conflict. It came to me. He didn't try to intervert. And then also, I didn't delegate stuff to him. You said, go do my dirty work. And I see a lot of offices, they'll do that with a spouse. And I, I hear that the pigeon theory, the wife comes in or the spouse comes in and poops all over and flies off. It's not there. If the spouse is working in the office, I think they need to be there on a daily basis. They don't come in 
and, and just do two or three things and gone. You have to earn that. You have to be in the ranks. And, and I still have that conversation with some of my clients. I'm like, I, you know, it sounds good on paper that your spouse is there, but is your spouse really there? So do you believe the dentist should be the first person there and the last one to leave? I do. Yeah. I do that. I do that. I do. Yeah. Um, I, I think you know, that every, every, every dentist knows you're supposed to lead by example. Then you sit right. there and say, okay, we'll lead by example. It's the same thing when dentists are telling me that they, they do th all these things to the patients. And I always point them to uh, the Federal Reserve saying that one third of Americans cannot go to the doctor during eight to five Monday through Friday working hours. They work in small businesses. They right. have, you know, everybody thinks everybody works for a Fortune 500 company. They don't even employ 10% of America. Everybody, mm -hmm. the average American works for a company that does less than 25 employees a year, less than $1 million a year, and they can't leave to go get a cleaning in the middle of the right. day. And I'll say, well, what are your hours? And they go, oh, Eight Monday, five, Thursday. Monday to Thursday. Yeah, so, uh, so you know, it, when, you, when, you're, when your hours are Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5, I don't want to hear all your moaning, bitching, and bullshitting because you're at that point – you don't even care and you're not even trying. Right. But, but a lot of dentists tell me this. So I want you to talk to this specifically. Howard, I want to change my hours to 7 a.m. I but do want to work Friday, but they, they'll get mad. And who's the boss? Who's the boss? So what do you say? You, you say just. I say who's the boss? I, I, I say suck it up, buttercup. That's what I say. Just suck it up, buttercup. You're the boss. You're the owner. So what, what should hours be? Where. What, what, what can you say as a professional dentist and dental consultant that these hours will give you a competitive advantage? Well, I think all practices have to be open on Friday. That is, that is the standard. Monday through Thursday is ridiculous. And I think a lot of, if you want to be proactive, you've got to be considering Saturday too. So you think, well, I'm a solo dentist. How am I going to do that? Well, you're going to float your hours. You need to have morning hours, late hours. You can rotate. You can have late on certain days and, and early on other days. But I think fr Friday is the standard, and it has to be there. And I think everyone needs to be looking at a Saturday. So what are you going to do about that? And that's going to have to bring in certain team members. Are you going to have to hire an associate doctor to help you with that? Because I don't think you should trade your life for, for dentistry. It's part of your life. But you're not going to be a seven-day-a-week uh, martyr there, just there cutting teeth, and you're going to find you dead over a patient someday. You've got to have systems in place and you've got to be able to uh, accommodate patients and what their needs are. And you know, um, a lot of these dentists, they, they don't think outside the box, like, like um, the all on four implant system. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you know what their great insight was? That there were all these specialists, oral surgeons and periodontists out in the rural areas that didn't have enough patients. They would gladly fly into the big city on weekends and do these big cases. Well, it works both ways. I got a lot of young, hungry specialists that one Friday a week drive three hours to a town of 5,000 where they've lined up all their wisdom teeth or all their ores right. or whatever. And it's the same thing with associates. I mean, you can get an associate to just come in Saturday who literally has a full-time job four days a week or five days a week or works at corporate or whatever, whatever. I mean, I mean you just, you just got to try. I, I, I think they, they, they don't want to try. And then, and, then the re, and then the way to get your mindset around delegating is imagine if, when Sam Walton died, all the Walmarts closed down. <laughs> or when Ray Kroc died, all the McDonald's closed down. And I don't know who invented Burger King, but if they ever all closed down and there was no more Whopper with cheeses, I would literally start crying. And, Even those uh, black ones, those are nasty. Those what ones? Those black bun ones. At Burger King? Yeah, the Halloween ones. You know what I like the most about Burger King is when you eat their French fries, when you get to the bottom, there's always a surprise, like an onion ring or half a tater tot. You know, they don't do that it's, at McDonald's. It's, it's like a prize. Yeah, it's you know, the mystery it, prize for Cracker Jack. It's like the, yeah. But, but um, why, I, I don't know why um, they can't do extended hours. I, I, so what, what the, the point I was making is the labor pool is so fluid. Yes. And it is so fungible. That when you sit there and say, well, I can't, I can't get an associate to come work in my office Friday and Saturday. Dude, the Navy can get a dentist to go sit in an aircraft carrier for six months, and you can't find a dentist. I mean, the all-on four program, I, every city I go to, it's like, oh, yeah, this guy, he lives in a town of $150,000, and he flies down to San Diego on the weekend, and he puts in, you know, five $25,000 cases, and then he flies back home. I mean, you know, you can... You just got to try. You got to be a businessman. And uh, so, I, so I wish you would do this. I, I just, I do these podcasts for free. I truly just want my homies 
to, to get help. Um, I'm doing this. You know how you, we say the morning huddles associated with success? Yes. I always saw all my friends that walked out of school and did 100 hours of CE every year for their whole career. They all mastered the game. And all right. the ones who didn't want to do CE. So I was sitting there thinking, well, I can give them an hour of, their, of great lectures for free in their cell phone while they multitask on the way to work. I wish you would do a one hour online CE course with a book deal. Like they sign up and they take your course and then, and everybody takes your course. We always email the course, whoever did the course, we email you and say, this guy, you know, uh, took your course and, and do like a book um, online CE deal. So they, they watch your course, they see you, they read your books, so they can pass it to their wife or office manager or staff or this or that. Because I just, I just want them to pull the trigger. And I know this is what I hate about my job. Everybody, um, everybody that doesn't need me is going to pull the trigger and get you anyway. And then everybody who desperately needs you isn't going to do it. That's why I'm going out right. of my way. I want you to do a podcast. You, what do you think about an online CE course with a book deal? Uh, I, I have course, no problem. We'll do that. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's do it. Yeah, send an email to um, I'm Howard at Dental Town. So when we hired Howard Goldstein, um, he became <laughs> Hogo. H O G O email him Hogo at okay. dental town and do that because I want to, uh, I want him to get help. And so I only got you for three more minutes. So I want to, I want to, um, tell you what I, I know how these guys think. I know how they think they say, you know what? I'm not going to get a consult. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to finally just bite the bullet. And I'm going to hire me an office manager and then yeah, I don't have to worry they'll about do it. it for me. Yeah. That'll, that'll, then I won't have to do anything. She'll do everything for me. Is that true? Is that is, a, is an office manager going to solve all my problems? Or what, what are your thoughts on office managers? Or do office managers need help too? They do too. And that's why I work with the doctor and the office manager together. They are both my client. So I help the, the doctor build the vision and what they want. And I get the office manager to get it done. And sometimes it's a communication issue. And we, that's where we really get the power. When I started bringing the team member into them and training that key person, that's when things went through the roof for them. So do you think, so when we talk about things successful offices do, we talk about morning huddles. Do you think the, the successful offices are more likely to have an office manager than not? It, well, a lot of people say they have an office manager. And to me, an office manager truly manages. And most offices don't because they're just a glorified receptionist. And I do not mean to discount anything that these people do. But their doctors don't give them the power and they don't know what an office manager should do. And um, I mean, leading people is a hard job. So if you're sitting there answering the phone, making appointments and filing insurance, you're not really the manager. You're, you're at the reception. You're doing a head job. And if there's some other little thing, you're coming into it. Um, you're kind of like the interference for the doctor. So we want really people who can plan. We want leaders within the practice. That's what we want to develop. We have a private office where they can shut the door and work on the business. They can pull employees yes. there, shut the door, work on the business, not answering the phone, checking in, checking out. They're basically, oh, it's a receptionist but he glorified her with a name tag that said office right. manager and she's not an office manager. An office manager works on the business, not in the business, but most office managers to me, uh, I see as a Saddam Hussein syndrome where the <laughs> Saddam Hussein, if any of his management team told him anything he didn't want to hear, they would shoot him. Uh -huh. So when he said, well, if I invade Kuwait, we can do this, right? The Americans can't keep me out. Everybody said, Oh yes, yeah, sure. sure. Oh, yeah. And, and so then that, so that it, 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 he died because, um, you know, he didn't have anybody to stand up to him. Right. And I've had Lori, uh, my office manager since, uh, year 1998 or something like that. So 18 years, but if an office manager has, she has to be a type person where she's not afraid of losing her job, that she knows she can get a job anywhere else any other day. Mm -hmm. And she's got to stay active on LinkedIn with her resume and be ready to go because unless she feels like she can stand up for you and she doesn't care about her job. She'd rather do her job right and tell you what it is. And the minute your office manager can't say to you, you know what, that's the stupidest idea you ever had. And the way you walked in here this morning and went up front and said, why the hell is there a two hour opening? Your opening remark just ruined their day. Yep. And you know, if they can't set you down and scold you and point your finger at you and stand up to you uh, without the fear of losing their job. It's the same with lab techs. There's not a good dentist out there who has a lab tech that's afraid of them. And when I talk to lab techs, they say only 10% of their clients are humble enough and high self-esteem enough where they can call back and say, 
Ginger, were you drinking Listerine when you prepped <laughs> that crown? You didn't give me any reduction. I can't follow the margin. I'm going to have to drop acid just to find this margin. Uh, you know, if, and, and you need to come down here because I want you to see the other preps I'm giving with. And if you send me an impression with a bloody cotton roll in it again, I swear to God, I'm going to come down to your office and make you eat it. Um, you know, if you don't have people that can stand up to you, then, then they're not, they're, they're not going to bring out the best in you. And, and I, I think the office managers are glorified receptionists. What do you think about the, uh, these dentists investing the money to send them to AADOM? They, they have an um, American Academy dental office manager. Right. They have a fellowship program. Do you see that as a return on investment? Do you think that's an organization that's uh, getting uh, these receptionists educated so they can come back and be office managers? I, I can't comment on that because I've never been to one of their events. I was going to try to go this year. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that fills the gap. I don't know, the, but I know if a doctor sends any team member back for training and has no idea what happened, there is no return on investment. I don't care if it's a hygienist or a dental assistant. You don't just send them and let someone else train them and solve all your problems and come back for you. So if there's no accountability and you don't know what happened there and you really can't monitor it, then that's not going to improve your situation. All right. Well, I can't believe growing up Kansas and my sisters all went to KU that I'm talking to an Okie, but... Uh... Boomer Sooner. Oh, my God. I crossed the line with my five sisters. I hope none of them see this podcast. They, they, <laughs> might, not, they might not forgive me. They, there's two enemies in Kansas, and one of them's in Nebraska, and the other yeah. one's in Oklahoma. But uh, go Big Red. But, uh, hey, Ginger, seriously, I'm a big fan of you. I'm a big fan of your book. Uh, Linda Miles is a big fan of you. Uh, uh, we, we talked about you. I saw her post on uh, Facebook and this and that. Um, everybody, every single person I know that's interacting with you just thinks you're the real deal and that you're just a rocking hot, amazing person uh, crushing it with your new book. So I hope to see that course on dental town because I think these guys need to see it. They need to read the book. They'll probably need to pass the book around to their staff because they're just gun shy on pulling the triggers. And if you're yeah. listening to this, you remember, remember the hardest thing for a human to figure out is that you you always hear your gut. She was talking about uh, mindset and she doesn't like the word mindset. She like gut set. You always hear the little birdie. Your problem is you always debate with your birdie. The birdie starts telling you your intuition and then you start arguing with your birdie. And when older people, when they hear the birdie, they shut up and say, okay, I heard it. I heard it. That's what I need to do. That's the difference between intuition and everybody else. Why do some people are so successful? Because they listen to the birdie. Why is everybody else miserable? Because they're always arguing with their own damn birdie. No. Don't argue with the birdie. If you need help, call someone. And I can't think of anyone more amazing than Ginger. And Ginger, thank you for having spent an hour with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Howard. And I look forward to your course online. It's going to happen. Go Ginger. Bye-bye. All righty.